so Sean Armstrong, uh, I'm co-principal of Rev Energy with Michael Winkler, and I want to talk with you about uh, building up. Because California is now a majority multifamily new construction state, it has been since 2008, and because our multifamily in cities where it's being built is generally four stories and above, it is now time to talk about Zona Energy multifamily, big buildings. So the first one, first slide is the Bullet Center. It's an amazing process. It's International Living Future Institute certified. It has its own water. It has its own sewage treatment. It has that amazing canopy of solar. The canopy of solar above it, uh, very innovative. They were able to do, I think, an EUI of like 12 to 18, and then they solarized it, and they got five stories done. I'm going to sh show you other examples. Next slide, please. So early efforts to solarize tall multifamily buildings, you can see a 2002 in Santa Monica, just the very beginning of solar being legit to back to 2001. And then 2015, a project they got to work on called Celadon, and so 12 stories of vertically integrated PV. Note that while prices for PV have dropped 80%, the efficiency drop of putting a panel on the wall is about 30%. So, there is a cost-benefit analysis I could have made just a few years ago. Like, this now makes sense. The price has dropped so much, I could stick that same sense of PV right on the side and we get the same energy out. So going vertical on the walls is, makes sense, although people are scared of it. But not that scared, but you're seeing it. Another early example that we can learn from, next slide, please, is um, early vertical PV and Xenia efforts, no energy loss, but tricky racks. So they're taking the panels and they're bending them out in the sun so they can imitate kind of a roof. And that um, is, like I said, it's a more expensive racking system, but it makes a lot of sense. Uh, next slide. This is the most ambitious one that I know of. This is uh, Bright Power out of New York, Bright Power of New York City, and they are uh, now in Oakland. This is 17 stories of stair stepping. So it's only a couple, two, three stories every single time it stair steps, and they have PV rays on the walls so they can access them with ladders and maintain them. On that note, don't maintain solar panels by washing them off. We've done a, this, it was presented at this conference a year or two ago that after spending thousands of dollars, they got a bump up in efficiency of 3%, 4%, and these were filthy. All the way, you cannot see the panels underneath filthy panels, and they'd only dropped a few percentage points. But they'd spent tons of money of getting people roped off to wash them. Just don't do it. Just leave the panels alone because the dust reduces the temperature, which increases their efficiency. There isn't necessarily a whole lot of electricity lost through dust. Make up your stories if we found demonstrably that it wasn't worth it, which is the, the, the take home. Because as you're going up and up and up, the question is like, what are you going to do to wash these things? Don't. So, uh, fire hose once every 20 years, just, you know. Um, Do you have a study or? Yes, so you know the project that's in Woodland, yeah. that, that is the, stu the study that Brian Dove presented here previously, and I can give that presentation because we have it, I think, on the website. So I could show you the slides. Of, <laughs> exactly. We'll, we'll follow Why up. Why is that a reason not to wash the purchase? Water saving. It's expensive. If it's easy to wash my own house. Totally. I, I didn't mean to say don't ever wash them, just in this context, high rise, mid rise, solar rays. <laughs> Keep it on moving here. Canopy solar, maybe you lose up here. Canopy solar to maximize the roof space. So we've been moving into this now. How do you elevate the PV ray eight feet up so that the fire department can run around underneath it? And you can get all the way to the parapet wall, not get shaded by the parapet wall, not get shaded by the elevator tower, not get shaded by all the compressors that are sitting there. So you're seeing neat examples. This one I'm showing you is a, a federal, Aspinall Federal Building in Grand Junction, Colorado. That's the slide you should be looking at. Pretty nice white historical building. They painted the array white underneath so that it blended visually from the front when the cherry blossoms are going off. You don't really see it. It's a very important issue in cities. Everyone wants these buildings to look awesome. It's you're stuck in a city, most of you, I'm sure, and you look around and you wish that the buildings looked like trees, and they don't. So then you start <laughs> complaining, and you're like, well, at least don't make it look ugly. So there. Next slide. So uh, these are three projects we're technically supporting right now. Each of them uh, are arguing with each other. I have all three different design teams, so fascinating coming out of that. 
So on the left top, that's 10, story, 10 stories in Washington, D.C. on the D.C. Beltway. Very excited about that. This will probably go up before Trump's done in office. And mm -hmm. it would be awesome that we can show this is 100% solar powered, all electric, on the Beltway, 250,000 cars traveling by every day. Ta-da! This is the future. Um, so that project is also trying to be passive house. Keep that in your mind for a moment. On the right-hand side, Quetzal Gardens in San Jose, down the bottom, that's five stories, Furman Gardens. Um, so these are all low-income housing. Upper left is for seniors, upper right is for uh, the general family population, down below is for homeless veterans and the general homeless population, all affordable housing. Tons of value engineering happens as a consequence. Next slide. So what I'm learning, what we are all learning, and this has been a huge group effort, um, let's talk about water heating. Just right, a reason why I'm following Sean Orem is because the coal Mac that you're seeing here is this really contentious topic. Why do people do central water heaters? Generally because they don't have the space to do an individual tank, or because they think individual tanks will be complicated to replace, or, or, or. But once you get to the decision-making point of you're going to do a central water heater, install a gigantic radiator in a building and try to stop it from being one, the options that you have, there's different ways you can size it with a capacity to put out energy and store energy, so B2 output versus gallons of storage. Three options that you see here, one's 3452 per apartment, one's 4616 per apartment, one's 3675. And then over on the right-hand side, check out the gas one. That's the gas boiler for comparison, 3568. Notice that that is more expensive than the one that we're actually using. The, and I want you to pay attention in yellow at the upper right-hand, option C. Look at the demo trenching, off-site, and then site lateral. Look at the numbers there. That's more than $100,000 there. It's like 130 grand. Now, 130 grand, that is more than the cost of the boiler, which is $100,000 up above it. So the infrastructure to the boiler is more expensive than the boiler. And that is an important breakthrough because if you only look at $100,000, you think, oh, what a cheap thing. It's not cheap at all. I mean, there's a, you have to shut down a street for weeks. You got people this deep in the street flags, everything. It's really expensive to disrupt the street and put in gas infrastructure. So Walton very kindly put that in. They're responsible for having to do that work. We got to finally see that gas was more expensive than the option that we were looking at for a central heat pump water heater, just for first cost. It, that made the decision, just so you know how developers make decisions. That's how I won, with a hostile architect who does not want to do this. Absolutely. Hope he's not listening. So um, next slide. Um, I want you to see here, though, that there is an important option to consider. If space is available and it takes a three by three closet, which some homeless housing apartments don't have that three by three, you have to do central because every square foot costs so much money and homeless people don't deserve tons of space according to public policy. Therefore, we're formerly homeless and then they're all like us. How? We're all sitting like, oh. You had a really small unit, huh? So individual tanks, the price first, 3,054, that was the cheapest of all the options that you saw by about $500 per apartment. All in, talking about the closet, we're talking about this and that. But note here, this apartment complex is 64 apartments, but I had 56 tanks in that little spreadsheet. That's because with an 80 gallon tank, they can do a somewhat central, they're doing two apartments per one tank. And that strategy for small apartments means you still don't have to do a restart loop, just have an 80 gallon tank between two apartments, and we're able to reduce the cost again, which is what they're going to do. It takes a little bit of time for the architect to figure out how to do it, but everyone's like, hey, this is about money and we want to lower costs. The other th thing to note is um, Sean gets the credit here for this awesome graph that I, I worship for what it represents. So in green, dark green atop, that shows you the maintenance energy and then in lighter green below that is the energy that is being delivered to tenants for hot water on the low on the far left that's an electric resistance tank and i put a little yellow bar over it to show what a heat pump tank would be and you can see how the heat pump tank is always lower than every awesome option for a central system and that is inherently true and it's not going to change so eliminating the radiator of the building is the strategy 
let's just pause and note how sweet that is that they're getting their, their back rubs. So you get um, higher COPs out of these individual tanks than you do general central systems. I'm um, just the product itself, the system itself, the replaceability. You just need a little dolly and get rid of this thing. You have to shut down an entire 200 unit apartment complex to fix a problem. So some of these issues of the need for backup, the absolute have to have it, you can skirt when you're only putting one or two apartments out of business for a day. Next slide, please. So this is a, a revelation that I learned this week. This is a cool thing to learn. So Furman Court, the nine story tall homeless project in Los Angeles, I was saying we need to put up a canopy. They were like, we don't even know what you're talking about. Like, I want a price. Like, mm, you're going to make us do a lot of extra work. Mm -hmm. like, I want a solar. That's why I brought you guys on this project. Give me a price for what it costs to be solar. This is the solar hoax I'm harassing. So after weeks and weeks and talks and talks, they gave me a real number. And they realized that mobilizing there was most of the cost. And elevating the solar array up eight feet made the difference of 7% increase in cost. So the difference in what we can handle on the right-hand side, a 22 kilowatt system on the roof that you see in blue versus a 42 kilowatt system above most of the roof and lower. And you can see the cost at 33.50 per kilowatt versus $3,800 per kilowatt. And you can see the offset, 12% of the whole building is 300,000 kilowatt hours a year versus 23%. And that 23% is the water here. So if we can put a canopy up, we can take care of the number one load of the building and maybe a little bit of area lighting or something. That's what you can do on nine stories when you use the roof and not all of the roof. I want to draw your attention back to those slides of vertical PV as a realistic option for high-rise buildings. Say again? It is not, oh, the one on the right-hand side is not bifacial, but rather um, translucent so that you can have recreational activities underneath it. Hey, John, I just wanted to Yes, Robert. One of the things we discovered, too, is that you could actually go over the height limit by up to 15 feet in Los Angeles County. Yeah. And as a result of that, you still max, fully maximize your footprint, uh, which was critical to the developer. Uh, so that's in the building code in uh, the state as well as the city of Los Angeles. Thank you for bringing that up because there's another one of these design challenges. I'm saying, oh, we can't because they didn't want to. We can't do this because it's going to you know, take away a affordable housing where you have to like take off a floor in order to put your solar array up. All sorts of things that we've managed, managed to work through. This is Robert Nice baby as we try to get firm and court electrified and solarized. Wind load issues. That's another issue for sure. Structural loading for wind, all that goes in. Next slide. So Sun Power has got the best rack. Just put that out there. They've got uh, <laughs> Um, they, they, they pop these things up, and they're called long span. And so they are just covering huge amounts of area. And that is what we're going to be likely using for um, Holly Hill, the upper right-hand corner. That is 450 households. And it's got a five-story tall parking garage next to it, and we're going to cover that parking garage. On the lower right-hand side, you can see in gray, in the image of the, the site plan, gray. And that whole thing gets solarized, and you can see the highway. So we're also going to be putting solar on the walls of the parking garage. This is our sacrificial building. We're going to cover the whole thing in panels because parking garages are ugly. Solar panels are less ugly than that. So that's a reasonable <laughs> thing to do. And then we get to showcase it to the whole highway. Next slide. Solar windows are now 11% efficient. And they're all over the world. This is not something that we're playing with here, but this is pretty darn real. You can get gorgeous skylights that are making electricity. They're picking it up, electricity on the sides usually, where they've got electrical wire hooking it. You can get ones that are like green, like you said, solar window in New York City up on the right-hand corner. You can get them different colors. You get them absorbing more electricity, less electricity. There's a manufacturer, I think, in San Luis Obispo. If you want to go down and hang out with them, they everyone claims to have the coolest product, so I'm not gonna. They claim to have a really cool product. Um, next slide. You're seeing people use this new material. Um, two of these are, are award-winning projects. They have an architecture contest for UC San Francisco Mission Bay every year. And you get to see amazing efforts. I don't know if they really did good energy calcs. I don't know if these things really would pull this off. But they're nice drawings. 
you know, and they're, they're doing it right. Um, next slide. And these are like eight, nine story buildings. That's it. I want to make sure you guys have your lunch. Are there any questions about that? Before we do the applause thing, are there any questions? Okay, fine, do it. <laughs> hey!